He must increase, and I must decrease. That's one of the most quoted statements in the entire Bible, and we do it to each other all the time. I've been struggling with this text all week, and I've got some neat things to share with you, and they're not what you think. A number of years ago, I was having lunch with a pastor in another state. He was having serious problems in his church. As he told me about them, I winced, and then he said, not only that, the elders of this church have required that I send my sermons to my predecessor for a critique. And I said, Sam, tell him to go, tell him, Tell them that you're not doing that. Tell them to hang it on their ear. He said, I can't do that. Jesus wouldn't have me do that. I said, if you don't, you won't be a pastor. And he's not anymore. But as I've studied this text, I thought, oh, my. Do you know out of that incident, I wrote a book called No More Mr. Nice Guy? And it's been published all over the world in a lot of different languages. In England, they called it, Don't Let Them Sit On You. And they have an elephant on the cover that's sitting on this guy. And I wrote it out of that one incident I just described to you. And as I've studied this text, I thought, oh, spit. Maybe I've been messing with people's minds in the wrong way for a very, very long time. He must increase. And I must decrease. While I was working on this this week, I got an email from a former student. And he asked me to pray for him and give him some advice. He said he was working on a sermon and it would only be, he's a youth pastor, said it would only be the second time that he had preached to big people. And then he said, Steve, the last time it was wonderful. Jesus came. Man, it just, I was so pleased with what God did. He said, my problem is, I find myself writing this sermon thinking about the last one, and I'm writing for performance instead of the glory of Christ. I told him, duh. I said, welcome to the club of sinners. Jesus has been using selfish, prideful, ego-centered, performance-oriented preachers from the beginning because that's all he's got. It's called clean water through dirty pipes. So deal with it, boy, and go preach. But then I, then I thought about this. Maybe that, maybe that wasn't a good thing to say. Maybe, uh, maybe I went a little uh, bit too far and interfered with what the Holy Spirit was doing in that young man's life. He must increase, and I must decrease. Let me read the whole text to you, and we'll put it in context, and then we'll dig in. I'm going to start reading at the 22nd verse of the third chapter of John, where John the Apostle writes as follows. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing an eon near Salim because water was plentiful there. And people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now, a discussion arose uh, between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing, and everybody is going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness with me that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase and I must decrease. 
he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He who bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, and God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now we're going to get to the subject of hand, but first I'm going to go down one side road. Please note, if you will, the theological discussion going on between the disciples of John and a certain Jew over the subject of purification in this text. It's really, it's really interesting to see there is a great transition taking place. John the Baptist to Jesus the Messiah. One preached, do it right or you'll die. One that preached, repent of your sins. One that said, this is the place where you stand filthy before a holy God. And the other saying, y'all come. You can be forgiven. There is living water. There is freedom. There is forgiveness. There is joy. If you will, turn with me to the 19th chapter of Acts. I want to show you something interesting in that place. Paul is in Ephesus, and he encounters some baptized believers. Let me read the text to you. I'll start at the second verse. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard there was a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. You're guilty all the time. I mean, you think about what you've done just this past week and you wince and you say to yourself, I can't believe I'm in church. That's because you've only had the baptism of John. Wake up in the middle of the night and think, I don't believe I'm saved. No God who was holy could love me. That's because you've only received the baptism of John. You've been trying really hard and failing really bad. And the harder you go, the worse it gets. That's because you've been baptized with the baptism of John. I think maybe I told you before about the little boy who killed his grandmother's pet duck with his new slingshot. I mean, the aim was perfect. He killed that sucker. And then he thought, good night. And he looked around. Nobody had seen him. So he dug a hole and buried his grandmother's pet duck. To his horror, his sister saw it all. And every time it was her turn to wash the dishes, she would say, remember the duck. Whenever it was her turn to walk the dog or to weed the garden, she would say to him, remember the duck. And this went on until he couldn't stand it anymore. And he decided to go to his grandmother and confess. And with great fear and trepidation, he said, Grandma, I got to tell you something. She said, I know what you're going to tell me. You're going to confess. You're going to confess to something that I saw happen. I was watching through the kitchen window, and I forgave you then. I wondered how long you were going to put up with the blackmail of your sister, and she hugged him. That little boy had the baptism of Jesus. That's what this is all about, by the way. It's not about our goodness. It's about his goodness. It's not about how wonderful we are and the witness that we make with our purity. It's the witness he makes through people like us, even preachers through whom clean water flows in a dirty pipe. 
That's what this whole thing is about. It's the difference between the baptism of John. I'm going to do it right if it kills me, and the baptism of Jesus, come here, child, and I'll love you. And I want to show you something else in this text. You'll notice that John the Apostle says that John the Baptist was baptizing in Enon and Salim. So that's in Samaria. So Samaria is the place of heretics. They got everything wrong. They really did. They worshiped in the wrong way and in the wrong place. The doctrines they believed were not right. They had screwed up everything. And John, the forerunner of Christ, was going to them and was baptizing. And I'll show you something else. If you'll look in your Bible, the very next chapter, the fourth chapter, it's the next incident described by John the apostle about Jesus. It's the place where Jesus meets the woman at the well in Samaria. She'd been married five times and she was screwing around with the guy she was living with. There's an indication in that text that she was a whore. And, and, what, and, she was not, and, so, and what did Jesus do? He gave her living water. And so she was not only a heretic in terms of her belief in biblical Torah doctrine, she was a horrible sinner, and Jesus gave her living water. Now, there's a principle here, and it's a really good principle, and it's this. That sometimes in order for people to hear, Jesus has to go to people who are wrong. Oh, my. Sometimes in order... For people to hear, Jesus has to go to people who are wrong. Not only that. Sometimes in order for people to hear, Jesus has to go to people who are dirty. You know, we're reformed. Aren't you glad? I mean, those Cretans just don't understand. It's very hard to be right, and we are right. It's the gift we give to the body of Christ, and it's the most dangerous place in our lives because if there is an awakening, and I believe we're sitting on top of one, it'll start in a bar before it starts in church because we're right. Being right is dangerous, and you're in church, so that means you're a little bit better than most of those that are out thinking about barbecue and drinking booze and screwing around and doing what people do on God's day. But you're in church. How about that? That's why Jesus won't come if we're not careful. He goes to people who are wrong and sinful because they're the ones to hear. And when we grant the possibility we could be wrong, we might get some of that. When we recognize how sinful we are, he might come. He just might come. Well, let's get to the subject at hand. Did you hear about the young man that went into the judge's office and the judge was working and he looked up and saw him. He said, son, take a seat. He said, sir, I'll have you know that I'm Senator Longacre's son. And the judge said, well, then take two seats. <laughs> well, if you struggle with the two-seat thing, I've got some things I want to teach you this morning. The first is a truism principle truism, and it is this. Humility, by its very nature, can't recognize itself. So if you think you've got it, you don't. Humility, by its very nature, doesn't recognize itself. So if you think you've got it, you really don't have it. Uh, humility and how I got it. What, you know, John said he must increase and I must decrease. What the fat does that mean? Does that mean I'm, does that mean that I got to eat dirt and die? You think? Well, you, you think, you think it means I got to grovel? That I can't be so loud? That I can't confront? I can't speak truth? Like Honey Tree, one of the early Christian singers sang, I'll just sit here in the hall waiting for him to call wringing my hands together and telling the world that I'm a worm. Is that what humility is? No, that's not what 
humility is either. Now, it's perfectly appropriate when you do an exegesis of this passage, it's perfectly appropriate to look at the man who spoke it and to use him as the example and the definition of what humility was all about. You wouldn't like John very much, to be honest with you. He smelled, wore camel's coat. I mean, uh, and he, he, you'd probably think he was a jerk. He never kept quiet. Did you hear Garrison Keeler's comment about a man in Lake Wobegon who was a drunk? And he went to a 12-step program and got sober. And when he got sober, they found out he was a jerk. <laughs> and there was no 12-step program for being a jerk. <laughs> I mean, that's what you think about John. He ate, he ate grasshoppers and honey. Now, I don't care how much honey you put on a grasshopper. I still don't think it's going to make it that good. <laughs> And he, gosh, he was not a wilting flower. He made an obscene gesture to the powers. He, because he did that, he was executed. This is not a nice, sweet, gentle person groveling to anybody about anything and saying that he's a worm. And yet he said, he must increase and I must decrease. So what in the world is humility? Real humility, not the false stuff that we think we've got when we pretend to be something that we're not. We're not that great. So what is humility? Well, let's look in the text. i got four things to show you, and then we'll go eat. First thing you ought to note is that genuine biblical humility is marked by awareness. Notice the statement, he must increase, I must decrease. And then just look at the statement that he makes down in the 31st verse. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. Oh, what did, what did he do? He just stood around and became aware of a truth that Jesus was big, and Jesus was really big. Did you know that Thomas Aquinas, one, one R.C. Sproul says, maybe the major theologian of all time, his favorite theologian, Thomas Aquinas, in the last years of his life, went into a monastery of silence and died there. And as he went into that monastery, he looked at all that he had written, all the great works that he had established for the church, even his summa. And he looked at all of that, and he said, it's all straw. And he went into the monastery, never to speak again until he said, why did he do that? What, what do you mean it's all straw? You worked hard on that. Because it is straw. Because everything in the light of his glory is straw. And when you see it, then Rick Warren's statement, as much as I hate it, makes sense. It's not about us. It's about God. It's not. Uh, later on, there's a wonderful passage where, where John's in prison. They're going to kill him. And he begins to doubt. You think you're the first one to ever have doubts? And he starts thinking, what if I've given my life to something that's a lie? What if I made a mistake about the Messiah? What if I'm going to die here and my whole life is going to be wasted? And so he sends his disciples to see Jesus. And Jesus, with great compassion, says to John's disciples, you go tell John about the blind who see. Go tell John about the, the cripples who've thrown away their crutches. Go tell John about the dead who've gotten out of their graves. Go tell John about the lives that have been changed. What was he saying? So he'll be aware. When his disciples went and said to John, whoa, John went, he's increasing and I'm decreasing. It wasn't something he did. It was something he recognized. It was a fact that was already in existence. And Jesus says, if you'll be sensitive to it, to you, go tell Billy. 
Go tell Sarah. Go tell Jane. Go tell Karen. Go tell Pete. Go tell Anna. Go tell Steve about the blind and the cripples and the lot. Let me, let me tell you something that happened to me three or four weeks ago. We were with our best friends in the mountains of North Carolina. We go up there a lot. And they have a carriage house on this on top of a mountain that's close to their house, and we stay in the carriage house. Uh, he, has a, he has a router in the big house, but it doesn't reach down to the carriage house, and it never has reached down to the carriage house. So if I want to get on the Internet, I've got to go up to his house to do it. It just it will not go. I've been there dozens of times. I've tried 500 times to get on the Internet without having to go, in this case, through the snow and ice up to their house in order to get my email. It just won't work. It never has, never will, and it never will again. But I went up and got my email from him, and I got a message from a friend of mine who told me about a man I never heard of who was dying and said, would you call him? He gave me the hospital number. So so I got my phone out and I called this man. And the lady at the hospital I said, so, said, I'm sorry, sir, but he's no longer here. Well, there was nothing I could do. I mean, I wanted to be pastoral and kind, but that's all I could do. And the next morning, I turned on my computer and it connected with the Internet. There was one email there and it was from my friend. And it said, so-and-so has left the hospital this is his home number. You've had a significant impact on his life. You call him. And then the connection went. It was gone. I couldn't retrieve it. I couldn't get it back. And I tried. Now, what would you have done? <laughs> well, especially in a thunderstorm, you get on the phone, you call that guy, and you call him quick, because that's what I did. I got on the phone, and I called him. When I got him, I talked to his wife, and she started crying. And she said, I don't believe that you... I don't believe that you called. She said, he can't talk, but I'm going to put the phone by his ear, and you can pray for him. And, and she said, by the way, he's okay with Jesus. That's because of what you said to him before. So I prayed a goodbye prayer to, for him. I said, I left Butch before you. And, we, and I went over to make sure he got it right. Butch has always been screwed up, but Jesus loves him. And, and Butch is going to heaven, and we want to thank you for that. Surround him now with peace, and surround him with your angels, and bring him home with great joy. And she got back on, she's crying, and she said, oh, Steve, said he opened his eyes while you were praying, and he smiled, and he died the next morning. I want to say, aren't I wonderful? I don't even know his name. I don't know what I said. I've never talked to them in my entire life. I can't make a connection happen in a place where it doesn't happen. I didn't have a thing to do with any of that. And when I recognized it, I went, whoa, it really isn't about me. All I got to do is to do what I do and recognize, be aware, wake up to an awesome God that I worship. And when I do that, you follow it under humility. That's genuine humility. Now, I want to show you something else in this text. Not only is humility marked by awareness, humility is moved by love. Look, if you uh, will, at the 29th verse. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him and rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. I repent of this before I tell you, but I don't care. I'm a sexist pig, and I'm old, and I'm not going to change, okay? I just can't help it. I know it's wrong. I'm doing a little bit better, but not a lot. But I, I've always kind of felt like the guy was supposed to go out and kill the bear, and then bring him home, and the wife is supposed to cook it. I couldn't find it in the Bible, but I know it's there. And if the bear chases him home, he's supposed to turn and defend his family against the stupid bear. That's what men do. That's why we're the way we are. That's 
that's the way it's always been. That's the way it always should be. And then my wife decided to go into real estate. You have no idea what that did to me. She not, and to make it even worse, she got a wicker attache case. A wicker attache case. Real people that make real money don't carry wicker attache cases. But but she's my wife, and I love her, and she loves me. So I was her cheer. She, she, do you know she was the most successful real estate person in her large real estate office? She made a pile of money. And you know why? Because I sent her out in the morning and said, You go, girl. You, you get a, you're going to shine. You're going to do so good that you... Why is that? Because of a love uh, thing. And you can quadruple that for Jesus. Jesus, I've never been loved by anybody for Jesus except Jesus. So when people say good things about Jesus, man, I rejoice. That's humility. When they say bad things about it, I get my gun out. It makes me angry. It really gets under my... Really gets, Malcolm Muggeridge one time at a theological institute in California where they were criticizing the national religious broadcasters, and I'm on their board with a, an elitist bunch of drivel. Malcolm Muggeridge came in early. He was supposed to be one of the speakers. And they had a panel discussion, and he stood up in the audience. Malcolm Muggeridge was the old man, the best-known face in all of England, the editor of Punch magazine. He had received Christ late in his life and wrote a book, Jesus Rediscovered. And I loved him. Used to be on Bill Buckley's program. Whenever he's on, I watch. Anyway, Muggeridge stands up, this old guy with bushy eyebrows, and he put his hands up, and he said, could I say something? And they said yes. And he said, I've just come from speaking for the national religious broadcasters. And I've been a Christian for such a short time that whenever I hear the name of Jesus spoken, even poorly, I rejoice. That's humility. Let him love you, man. Get forgiven. I mean, do something do something you need forgiveness for and let him love you. And then you'll rejoice when anybody says anything wonderful. That's called him increasing. It's called you decreasing. And it's not eating dirt and dying and it's not groveling, okay? Then thirdly, not only is biblical humility uh, marked by awareness, and moved by love, please note that it's manifested by joy. Look down at the, the 29th verse. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom stands and hears him and rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. And just to make sure we got it, John continues, therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Where in the world did we get this idea that humility is serious? And the more serious you are, the more humble you are. That's from the pit of hell, and it smells like spoke. It's just not true. Jesus is the place where there's laughter, and you know why there's laughter? Because you're free. Because you're forgiven. Because you're going home. Because Romans 8.28 is true in your life. Because he loves you. And you'll never be forgiven more than you are right now for everything you've ever done or doing or ever will do. How about that? And if you don't start, if you don't get the giggles over that, you're dead. Do you know, you know who called me this week? Old bachelor friend of ours, John DeBrine. He, he's like old bachelors, mean. He's the best Bible teacher in America when he's on. I tell students that. And they say, well, who's the second best Bible teacher in America? And I say, John DeBron when he's off. And he, and he really is. And he's on Cape Cod, and we've been friends for 100 years. And I love it when he calls, and he loves it when I call. He doesn't have many friends because bachelors, he's too mean. <laughs> he's got a German shepherd. Now, I love my German shepherd, but when you love your shepherd more Never mind. But anyway, I, you know, so you know what we talk about theology, right? No. 
what we believe, no, our ministry. No, we giggle. We li- you know what he told me? He told me a story that Warren Wearsby had told him about a guy who was serving. He said Wearsby wouldn't tell him what church it was, but it was a prominent church. And they had a glass pulpit, and he looked down, and his zipper was down. Now, the problem is, if you're behind, you know, if I have that problem, I can fix that. I'll do it quick. You won't even... You won't even know. But if you got a glass pulpit, man, the whole world sees. And he didn't know what to do. So he noticed the flag was a little bit skewed. So he thought, I'll go over and move the flag. And when I get behind the flag, I'll zip up my zipper. And it worked. He pulled it off. Except he got the flag caught in his zipper. <laughs> and John said, John said, as he walks across the platform, he's pulling the flag behind him. And everybody is laughing. And we laughed and laughed the way you're laughing right now. Why are you laughing? In church, no less. Because joy is a part of humility. Because you don't have anything to protect. You don't have to pretend anymore. And there's one other thing, and we're out of here. Biblical humility is, um, is marked by awareness. It's moved by love. It's manifested by joy. And it's measured by power. Look at 33 and 34. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, and here it comes, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Humility are people with power because they don't have anything to lose. We... uh, do you think about spots on contemporary Christian uh, radio stations all over the place? And uh, John Frost directs those. He's a dear friend. He programs most of the big contemporary Christian stations around the country. And I love him a lot. But he comes in and he works with Eric and with me as we put those together. I have to do 20 cuts, every, sometimes as many as 40 cuts before we get it right. And uh, Eric, it takes him a whole day just to do one 60-second spot with all of the sound effects and the music to go in, and he's the producer. George Abheider, who's here this morning, does some of those too. So it takes him a, it's a lot of work. And, and sometimes I just get fed up with Frost, and I just say, get out of my face. He'll say, be nicer. You're a nicer person than that. You sound angry. How's, how are people going to listen to you if you sound? I said, Okay. And then I try to be soft and grandfatherly and sweet and talk about love and grace. And then he tells me, do it again. Then do it again. Then do it again. And finally, I just get so I get, and I just say, get out of my face. Leave me alone. And he went in the first time to Eric and said, I think Steve's really ticked at me. And I don't know what I did. And Eric said, he's ticked at everybody. He's not ticked at you. He just has something to do and you're messing with it. And the last time we were together during those spots, you know what John said to me? He said, Brown, I got you figured. I said, you got me figured? Yeah, he said. You don't care. You don't give a rip. You really don't care. So you will say anything that you think to anybody that you see anytime you're around them because you don't care. Now, I don't think that's true, but there's some truth to that. As I have been in the process of sanctification, I'm not important. That doesn't mean I'm less loud or less in your face. I just, I, I just really don't care. I mean, I worship a king, a high king of heaven. I, uh, he loves me more than he loves you. I, uh, I'm free. He's never going to let me go. I'm going to get home before the dark. So I don't care. And the older I get, the less I care. And the freer I get and the more power that God gives through his spirit to somebody who runs to Jesus. I, uh, as you know, I teach seminary students to talk better. We call it communications. Now, I'm emeritus, but I still teach those courses. And occasionally I'll do a lab class, and that's students that have never preached before. They just, and you know, they're scared to death. You could wring a gallon of water out of their shirts after they, you know, and I try to make it better for them and stuff. So I I tell them, I say, look, you got to talk to yourself. Before you get up to preach at church, when you're home, any other place or here, before you get up to preach, you say to yourself, 
you get out of my way, I'm the man. And I tell women to say that too. I'm the man, and I'm here. I've been commissioned by the high king of heaven to say what I'm going to say, and by God, I'm going to say it, and by God, you're going to listen. And students go, whoa, you can't say that. I said, all right, if you can't, do it anyway and repent later. Jesus will forgive you. But it'll get you through your sermon because you've got this idea of groveling nonsense that's going to kill you when you get into the bullpen. <laughs> and then I tell them, uh, you know, when this is over, you go stand in the back of the church. And the Christian liturgy takes place. They say, wonderful sermon, and you say, I'm glad God used it. I said, break the liturgy. This is what you say to the first person who says it's a wonderful sermon. Smile and say, you know, it really was. In fact, I think that's the best sermon I ever preached. I mean, I, this morning was amazing, wasn't it? In fact, I was so good this morning, I was taking notes on myself. And you say, Steve, I can't believe you tell students that. Well, if you listen to what I taught you this morning, you know why. You think about that. I'm in.